John F. Kennedy was the youngest man ever elected president. At his inauguration, Kennedy told the world that he represented America's youth. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. Kennedy's new generation was the youth of America. In them, Kennedy inspired hope and the promise of a better tomorrow. I've been through 10 presidents, almost 50 years of watching that White House, and that was special. There was a feeling in that administration by these young people who came to Washington that this was a wonderful time, and it was. Number 35, John F. Kennedy, Democrat, 1961 to 1963, 43 years old, from Massachusetts. John Kennedy would be in office for less than three years, a fabled thousand days. But in that short span of time, he changed history. He changed the American political system. He changed America culturally as well. He became the great role model about how American men should look, dress, act. Kennedy had lived a charmed existence, and it showed. He and his wife Jacqueline looked like movie stars. In terms of the Cold War, the Kennedys were the best advertising there was for capitalism. John F. Kennedy was magic. I mean, he lit up a room. People were attracted to him, fell in love with him his entire life, both men and women. Kennedy's sexual dalliances would eventually become well known. But while president, he successfully compartmentalized his private life, including the fact that he suffered from many debilitating illnesses, such as Addison's disease. Kennedy's hidden health problems and sexual appetite never seemed to interfere with his ability to effectively lead. And he did this with an open-door policy. Kennedy was his own chief of staff. He often described himself as uh, the hub in the middle of a wheel. Uh, he uh, wanted people coming directly to him and tell him the bad news. Among those who came to JFK early in his administration was the director for plans of the CIA. He wanted the U.S. to secretly launch a scheme known as the Bay of Pigs. The plan called for a group of Cuban exiles to overthrow Castro's communist regime. Kennedy okayed the operation. It was a disaster. Even more surprising was Kennedy's response. There's an old saying that uh, victory has a hundred fathers and defeat is an orphan. He thought the only way out was to take complete responsibility. I'm the commander-in-chief. I said this. Following the Bay of Pigs, we have a documented record of a president with a learning curve, a president who had changed his entire method of operating based upon the fact uh, that he bore sole responsibility for the failure at the Bay of Pigs. By accepting responsibility, Kennedy earned the trust of the nation. With that, he embarked upon a noble and far-reaching agenda to forge a better society. Members of the Congress, he created the Peace Corps and planned a war on poverty. And most inspiring, he challenged America to reach for the unimaginable. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. This was a huge idea and an enormous gamble. Such audacity would serve Kennedy well during his defining moment in office, the Cuban Missile Crisis. On October 16th, 1962, President Kennedy called me in in the morning and said that he had received a briefing from the CIA which showed through aerial photographs that the Soviet Union had just placed or was in the process of placing in Cuba bases for medium and intermediate range nuclear missiles that were capable of delivering a nuclear payload almost anywhere in the United States. A week later, Kennedy spoke to the nation. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. I've never heard a more chilling speech. I thought, wow, he's saying 
we may go into thermonuclear war. And in fact, I think we were that close. A cold warrior at heart, but not a hawk, Kennedy refused the advice of military commanders who pressed him to launch an airstrike on Cuba. Instead, Kennedy kept a cool head and chose a conciliatory course of action in his negotiation with Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev. Together, they forged a peaceful conclusion to the crisis. While strong on foreign policy, Kennedy was much less proactive on domestic issues, particularly civil rights. At least until 1963, when he personally watched television reports of the violence in Birmingham, Alabama. There, Martin Luther King Jr. was leading a massive protest against segregation. And the scenes of fire hoses tearing the skin off of young children's backs who were marching peacefully and dogs attacking protesters, it changed the public mood in the North and changed the public mood nationally. And it changed the mood within the Kennedy administration. While Kennedy gained a new appreciation for civil rights, he remained an ardent foe of communism. Late in his first term, as trouble brewed in Southeast Asia, he hoped to strengthen South Vietnam by overthrowing its tyrannical regime. On November 1st, 1963, Kennedy approved the assassination of the president of South Vietnam. And from that day on, we owned Vietnam. Twenty days later, on November 21st, Kennedy visited San Antonio, Texas to join Vice President Lyndon Johnson at the opening of a new space facility. This nation has tossed its cap over the wall of space and we have no choice but to follow it. The next day, he and Jackie went to Dallas. From Dallas, Texas, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. The assassination of Kennedy uh, was uh, probably the most traumatic thing that uh, uh, occurred to our population uh, since at least Pearl Harbor. There was a lot of hope resting in his presidency that he had not yet realized that suddenly people were denied. The hopes and dreams Kennedy brought with him to the White House were enhanced by his martyrdom, making his presidential legacy grow well beyond his actual accomplishments in office. The idealism, the commitment to public service, the desire that people should give something of themselves uh, back to America, I think these are some of the most important legacies of the Kennedy administration. Only two men have been elected president while holding seats in the U.S. Senate, Warren G. Harding and John F. Kennedy.